Hello, readers and writers. I'm Professor Grandpa Tonio, the book guy and the writing guy. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to a multiple award-winning author who has published more than 30 books for children and teens. Her books include super interesting poetry collections and entertaining, heartfelt picture books that explore a wide range of topics, including human diversity in apple pie, 4th of July, yoga positions in twist yoga poems. And by the way, I enjoy doing the positions, dream poems in night garden, and seriously, yes, poems about driving and behind the wheel. If you get hold of Janet Wong's picture book titled the dumpster diver, you'll, you'll meet up with Steve, a kid who enjoys turning people's trash into treasure. And if you are lucky enough to read me and Roly Malou, Janet Wong's graphic novel, you'll get caught up with what happens when an unpopular fourth grade girl decides to cheat on a math test when the most popular girl in school asks her to give her answers. Janet Wong has also joined her colleague, Sylvia Vardell, to create a widely popular series of poetry books called the Poetry Friday Anthologies and the Poetry Friday Power Books that introduce you to poems you're gonna love to read out loud with your friends, along with many activities that make the poems come alive. Janet Wong is a popular speaker and workshop presenter in schools, libraries, and bookstores around the world. And she once made such a dramatic career change, which she'll tell us about today, that she was a featured guest on the Oprah Winfrey Show, CNN, and at the White House. Wow. Janet Wong was born in Los Angeles and now makes her home in New Jersey with her family. Welcome, Janet Wong. I'm delighted to be talking with you today about your, your life as a writer. I, I'm so, it's been such a long time since we talked in general, and then all of a sudden, here we are again. This is wonderful, and you say it's about 15 years later. Thank you for taking precious time out of your busy schedule to talk with me. Well, thank you, Tony. You are one of one of the gems in children's literature. I love how you described yourself as Professor Grandpa Tony, and uh, this is just an honor for me to be able to chat with you. Oh, I'm so happy, Janet. My first question, in a suitcase of seaweed and more, your recently reissued collection, your poems tell us a lot about growing up in California, particularly about family life. What do you most remember about your childhood? I think what I most remember is freedom of choice, independence, and having a lot of responsibility. Uh, and those are all things that I think kids need more of today. It's a tough world we live in, and it's hard to let kids have choices, but that's what makes us individuals. That's what makes us who we are. And I remember playing outside like so many of us who are over the age of, well, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50. So many of us remember playing outside on our own, just free to do what we wanted to do. Um, I wrote Min and Jake about catching lizards with my friends. And yet we also had responsibilities that a lot of kids today don't have. So in A Suitcase of Seaweed and More, I wrote about how one of my jobs was washing the rice and getting it ready for the rice cooker uh, before my parents came home from work. So freedom of choice, independence, responsibility. It was a pretty happy childhood. How wonderful to hear that because we really do need, I think, to keep those values forward in our lives so that our children inherit that kind of, of a life, uh, you know, that they can look forward to. You've written, this is a quote, I have always been aware of the three sides of me, Korean, Chinese, and American. How do your three sides figure into your writing, if they do, that is? <laughs> Oh, they definitely do. My mom was Korean. She passed away two years ago. Um, uh, she came to this country when she was in her 20s from Korea, married to my dad, who 
was born in China and lived there until he was about 12 years old, then came to this country and went to Korea as part of the U.S. Army. So he met her, married her, brought her back, and I was born and, and raised in California. So um, those three sides of my identity really do inform my daily life. It's, if it's not one thing, it's, it's another. Um, but I think one thing that a lot of people do is sometimes confuse culture with just family preference or quirkiness. I'll, I'll hear people say, oh, I do this because, you know, that's our culture. And I'll think, well, I don't know, I'm Korean too. And I think you do it just because you like to do it. So sometimes we need to be careful about what we ascribe to culture. Well, that's interesting. I just think that sometimes I make that, that leap in my own mind, you know, that naturally, you know, it's the cultural aspect of it. And, and, and I think really in so many ways, it's actually just the, the life aspect of it. <laughs> you know, we're just living your life. Um, you know, in light of the fact that, uh, let's say I'm Italian American and with part Spanish, you know what I mean? But uh, I don't know how that figures into my life as much as uh, some people think it should. Let right. Me, yeah. at, what, at what point is it, is it your personality, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and also how I look at the world. I mean, you know, I, my mother was an immigrant. She had a, a kind of immigrant way of looking at being in this country. You know what I mean? And so I picked up on that as the years went on. So I think that filters into to the way I look at life, you know, at, on, on some level. Let's get back to your early poems in Good Luck Gold and other poems. I love that title. Published in 1994. Rereading these poems, I, I felt a strong and still very fresh voice. What kinds of experiences do you reveal in these poems? Well... Some of the poems are about growing up Asian American in Los Angeles, and some of the poems are just about growing up, right? But in terms of freshness, I am really proud that some of the topics are still very current today. I'm also very sad that some of the topics are still very current today. For instance, there's the poem Waiting at the Railroad Cafe, which is about racism. I wish we were in a post-racist society, but we're not. There's the poem, Speak Up, where I'm being badgered for speaking Korean, and I say, um, at the end, I say, um, uh, I, I, I can't speak it, right? And the, um, I was born here. And then the, or the kid who was badgering me says, but I was born here, and I answer, so was I. Yeah. Well, I wish we didn't have those issues still present today. But because we do, I hope that people will look to some of those poems and say, yeah, you know, um, I could definitely use this to start a discussion with my students, with my kids. Perfect. I love that. I mean, that, I remember the railroad station. The, right, waiting at the railroad cafe. Yeah, oh, that, I, that blew me away. And when I reread it now, I mean, I hadn't seen that poem in many years. And I, re I reread it just recently and I thought, this is still going on, unfortunately. It is still going on. And actually, it's going to, to, we're going to have a resurgence of racism and xenophobia, in particular against Asians because of uh, coronavirus, right? Coronavirus will infect anyone. You don't have to be Asian, right? You don't have to be only Italian or Iranian or Spanish. It can affect anyone anywhere. But... You have politicians calling it the Chinese virus, which is perhaps factually accurate because it originated, it, so we think, in, um, in Wuhan. But uh, reinforcing that xenophobia and that racism by calling it the Chinese virus isn't helping anyone. And so I think that poems like Waiting at the Railroad Cafe are going to be absolutely necessary again, again, to generate a discussion uh, between adults and children where we explore our feelings and talk about how, yes, sometimes the world is unfair. And so what are we going to do about it? Perfect. In, in your deeply sensitive picture book, Apple Pie, Fourth of July, your young character is experiencing a strong cultural tension. I wonder if this tension reflects a childhood problem you worked through. 
Well, you know what's funny is my parents did own a mini mart that sold Chinese food to go, but they didn't own that until I was already an adult. I did, however, spend time there when I would bring uh, uh, my son, who was two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old, when I would take him there to go visit grandma and grandpa, and they would go fishing or they would go crabbing, and I would uh, man the store. And so I did do some time in that store. But uh, all my life, uh, I have been working in different businesses that my parents owned. I actually started working when I was four years old in the beauty shop that my mom owned, just a teeny tiny beauty shop in Los Angeles. And it was on Vermont and 8th. And what I would do is I would sweep hair when she cut people's hair. I would sweep hair off the floor. This was when I was four years old. And, and then when she got tired of me, she would send me down to my grandparents' teeny tiny restaurant, which was three or four doors down, and I would wait tables. So um, that's really uh, part of who I was growing up. Oh, there we go for responsibility again. I mean, <laughs> you said you were four. I, I think that's fabulous, you know, that we that they, they trusted you that much or, you know, realized that you needed to have those those kinds of responsibilities. I think that's terrific. We'd love to hear you tell about the delightful story you reveal in A Suitcase of Seaweed, a poem that's at the center of your collection of the same name. Oh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one is about my Korean grandmother, my Halmoni, and I first met her when I was four years old and traveled with my mom to Korea for a vacation, and I next saw her when I was in seventh grade. I was in seventh grade, and uh, we had gone to meet her at uh, the airport, LAX, and so she was, she was coming through the Los Angeles airport. And we had to wait behind the, the line where all the visitors were waiting for their uh, family members and, and friends and, and, and whoever to emerge from customs. And I remember waiting, waiting in, in that area and seeing her come out dragging a heavy, heavy suitcase, just pulling it behind her. And the suitcase was so full, it had been, she had shut it with duct tape. Thank goodness the customs officers didn't ask her to open it, right? Because she, she would have had to cut it open, which is what we did when we got home. And when I saw her dragging that suitcase through customs, uh, I thought, oh, she has things for me in there. I'm sure she does. She must have those Korean dresses, those big fancy silk dresses, billowy dresses that take up a lot of room. I thought, oh, she has those fancy Korean shoes that look like little canoes, well, we took the suitcase home, we cut it open, and inside we found seaweed. <laughs> dried seaweed, dried squid, dried little fishes, and all the things, dried chili pepper, all the things that my mother had said that she missed. You see, over the years, my mother had written letters home saying, Oh, I miss our, my favorite foods. I miss the seaweed. I miss the squid. I miss the little fish. And in Los Angeles, even in Los Angeles, which today has hundreds of maybe thousands of Korean stores, back in uh, the, the early 60s and, and, well, back in the 1960s and all the way through the early 70s, you couldn't find those ingredients very easily. And so... You know, being a, a, good, a good mother to my mother, my grandmother said, I'm going to feed my daughter. And she brought all those <laughs> things. She only brought a little bit of clothes. She didn't bring any gifts for me, I don't think. And uh, so that's why I wrote the poem. Oh, well, it's, it's delightful. Um, and uh, very, I mean, I can just, that you, you paint that picture so beautifully. I just see her dragging that suitcase. I, I love that. Well, and then years later, when I was in college at UCLA, she came back to visit. My Korean grandmother came back for what was her last visit to this country. And this time she brought a pillowcase, a pillowcase that was stuffed full of something and sewn shut. And I said, what's in here? What's in here? She opened it up and there inside the, the pillowcase were 20 pounds of Peanuts, peanuts. <laughs> and I said to my mother, tell Halmoni 
we have peanuts in this country. I couldn't tell her because I don't speak Korean. And my, my, my mother told uh, my grandmother, and then Hagmani said to my mother, tell her you don't have my peanuts. <laughs> and, and she was a farmer. My grandmother was a farmer. And one of the things that she grew was ground nuts or peanuts, which in Asia are much more dense and really a different flavor than, than the, the peanuts that we can get at baseball, baseball games and, and Costco and, uh, and different from what you get in peanut butter here. Wow. I'm glad she brought those peanuts. After. I bet you are. Yeah, I can see why. Um, here's another one. Uh, the book, uh, The Trip Back Home, your award-winning picture book. I see it as a tender story of family love. And it seems to me the story is a tribute to the simple pleasures that unite people, young and old. What does this childhood trip teach your young protagonist? Well, thank you for describing the book that way. I feel that it's the same thing. It's about how, how small things, little things and experiences uh, unite us and bring us together. But what I personally took away from that trip and what maybe someone, a reader might get from that book is that not all Asians are alike, right? Not all Asians are alike and there might be a very big difference between someone who's Asian and living in Asia versus someone who is of Asian descent living here. And uh, one thing about that book is it, it was based on my memories of visiting rural Korea when I was four years old. So this was back in, in the mid 60s and rural Korea. Um, they were not in the bustling city of Seoul. They actually uh, on their farm did not even have indoor plumbing. And so sometimes um, people will look at that book and say, oh, you know, that's not how Korea is. Well, that's not how Korea is today. That's not how Korea was in the mid 60s in Seoul. But where my, my family had their farm, that's how it was. And so also there was that urban and rural tension. You know, I had come from, um, from living in Los Angeles, smack in the middle of the city of Los Angeles, to all of a sudden visiting my grandparents on a farm where they went to the toilet in uh, a place where the pigs were walking around. So um, there, are, there are a lot of different things to explore, again, with young readers to talk about in that book. Oh, I bet. I mean, I like the way you describe that compared to like the city of Seoul. I mean, here you have, I wanna, I'm going to use the word culture in a sense, and I, might, I, hope, I, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I think the idea is that it, it is a, a different world completely that you were introduced to as a child. Right. Well, and if anyone has seen the movie Parasite, right, oh. this year's Best Picture winner, in, within that movie, you see two completely different worlds within the city of Seoul, right, based on, uh, on class differences, the very, very um, oppressed uh, world of, uh, of, of the poor in Seoul, of the working class, um, and, and the, the extravagant lifestyle of, of the professional class, of the rich. So all kinds of different worlds. And we have, we have that here in the United States too, you know? Um, when, you com when you compare the, the lives that the 1% lead compared to the, the lives that maybe even the bottom 20% in our country lead. Uh, all of these things are, are hard to talk about, but books give us a window and books give us a way to bring these up and to help us all learn, not just kids, but we, we adults can learn from kids and from our discussions with kids. Well, yes, because so much comes up. I mean, whether it's a misconception or whether it's a bewilderment or a wonder, you know, and from that, we learn from, from children. I, I, it happens to me all the time. You, uh, you were awarded a Lee Bennett Hopkins Award Honor for the heartfelt poems in The Rainbow Hand, poems about mothers and children, gorgeously illustrated by Jennifer Hewitson. Please tell us about the vision of motherhood you set out to explore in these poems. Well, I wrote that book when our son was three years old. 
And all of a sudden, I was feeling incredibly appreciative of my own mother as I realized how hard it was to be a mother. And so that book, The Rainbow Hand, has a mix of perspectives. My perspective as a new mother mixed with my perspective as a daughter, reflecting on things that my mother did. Probably my favorite poem in that book, though, has actually nothing to do with everyday motherhood. It's a poem that I wrote about one story that I heard as a child and that really stuck with me about how one day my mom, who for most of her life, was between 85 and 90 pounds, four foot, four foot 11, 85, 85 pounds. How one day my mom was approached at a bus stop by a big bully and he was harassing her and she felt like she was under attack. So what did she do? She flipped him on the sidewalk. She <laughs> flipped him on the sidewalk and there he was. And he was, and she was, I don't know if, if, if this is true or if it's just, my memory of the story as it was embellished over the years, but I have this vision in my mind of her kicking him, kicking him and kicking him and him screaming, help, help, somebody, somebody call the police. But <laughs> he was going to attack her or had actually uh, started to attack her and she knew how to defend herself, so she did. And um, I wrote a poem in The Rainbow Hand uh, honoring her called Crazy Mother. That's one of my favorite poems in that book. Well, I can see why. And I, and I, I love the fact that when, if, when you're talking to kids about this, there's, there's a strong woman, you know, however tiny she was, right. she was able to muster her courage and her strength. And, well, uh, and, and when I do share that poem with kids, um, I always preface it by, I do not advocate violence. I don't believe in fighting, but I do believe that if somebody attacks you, you don't let yourself get beat up. Um, that you either, one, run away, or you defend yourself. Yeah. But I probably would run away. I would run away and I run so slowly, I probably would have been caught. So, so it makes me appreciate my mother even more. The choice, the choice. No, I know what you mean. I, 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 get, so, I get so worried about uh, violence. I'm going to turn to your grandfather now. I love, I love your characterization of your grandfather in, in the poem you titled Poetry in a Suitcase of Seaweed and More. To me, the poem says as much about your grandfather as it says about you. I wonder if you agree with my awareness of the poem's topic. Well, it does say a, a lot about my grandfather. Um, in poetry, his, uh, he misinterprets the word poetry, which in real life, we had a conversation when I was, when I was starting out and I told him, oh, I'm, I'm going to write children's poetry. I'm writing children's poetry. And he said, poetry. And he was, I could, I could see him, you know, have, running that over in his mind. And he said, poetry. And he actually did say, it got fruit, you know, because he was thinking, what kind of tree is that? There's a pear tree. There's a, this tree. There's a, that tree. I never heard of a poetry. And um, I just loved what he said so much that I decided to write that poem. But uh, from his point of view, what I wanted to to do in terms of being a writer, that was fine with him. He, he, because he didn't really know much about it. I, I tried to explain it and he couldn't understand what was a poem. And I said, it's a short story. And he said, oh, story. I said, short, very, very short. And so I could see him thinking, huh, she's, she's leaving her, her job as a lawyer to write short stories, very, very short. He was trying to wrap his mind around this, but then he said, oh, okay, all right, that's fine. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's one, that's one. I, I just, I, I roared when I reread that poem. Yeah, that's really funny. And, and a note to that same poem, you wonder if your grandfather was thinking about your very dramatic, I almost said wild career change. What caused you to make that change, to move from a labor relations lawyer at Universal Studios in Hollywood to a writer for young readers and writers? 
Well, as I often tell kids when I'm, when I'm doing an assembly, I say, you know, I was director of labor relations at Universal Studios Hollywood. My job involved um, negotiating nine different union contracts, deciding how much money people would make, how many vacation days they could take. And when they did something bad, they ended up in my office and I had to fire them. And I was firing so many people on average each week that one night I came home and I said to my husband, I think I'm becoming a mean person. And he said, uh huh. Yeah, you are. And I love spending money. Um, but I said to myself, what's the use of all this money if I'm not proud of who I am? And I thought, I want to do something good with my life. I want to do something important. And I couldn't think of anything more important than working with kids. But I had been a substitute teacher when I was working my way through Yale Law School. And one of my jobs was being a substitute teacher and being a teacher is the very hardest job I have ever had. I knew I wouldn't survive as a teacher. Um, I did want to work with kids. I didn't yet have a child of my own. Uh, now I do. He's uh, 26 years old. But, um, but I had a two-year-old cousin and it was her birthday. And I took her to a little teeny tiny local bookstore. And my idea was I'll let her choose a book maybe two, she's a book or two as a birthday gift. And the next thing I knew, I had an armload of picture books for two year olds that I wanted to buy myself mm -hmm. because I loved them so much. And the idea hit me, somebody wrote these books. Why couldn't I be one of these people? And I didn't have any idea how to write a book or how to get it published, but I thought if I go to the library, I can figure it out. And so um, I went to the library. I said, I, I told the librarian there, I, I, I wonder if you have books on how to get published, how to write and get published, because that's what I'd like to do. And she led me over to shelves and shelves and shelves of about everything from uh, uh, writing screenplays to writing mystery novels to writing uh, picture books for children. And I checked out a dozen books, read them, and decided this was what I wanted to try doing. And I, I said to my husband, I wanna quit my job, my law job. I wanna quit my job and, and, and try writing for a year. And if at the end of the year I've sold a book, then I'll keep on doing it. And if not, then I'll go back and go back to being a lawyer. And lucky for me, uh, he was more realistic than I. And he said, why didn't you do this for a year? And it doesn't matter if you get published. Why don't you do it for a year? And if you love it, then keep doing it. And at the end of the year, I was not yet published. I had not yet sold a book, but I did love doing it. I remembered what he said and I kept on doing it. And six months later, a year and a half after I got started, my first book, Good Luck Gold, was sold. No, that's great. What, what is the title? Good Luck Gold. Oh, that good, was the first one, the right? First one. Yeah, that's right. That's, oh, that story is, that, that, I mean, that story needs to be repeated. For, for the courage, I mean, once again, for the courage, you know, to, to make that leap, you know, and, and yes, and I can understand, I can understand your love of the books, you know, because that's, I mean, I've spent so much of my life being mesmerized by the beauty and, uh, and, you know, the joy of the way those children's books look at life in such a fresh way, whether it's di di uh, difficulty and harshness or whether it's, you know, the beauty of life. I mean, I just, I just, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm there with you in that. But when you, when you moved from the, being a lawyer to a poet, did you do anything? What did you do to learn about writing poetry? Well, the first thing I did was uh, I joined a group called SCBWI. And this is something that I recommend as a first step for, uh, for anyone who's interested, seriously interested in learning more about the, the children's book business and getting published. It's the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, scbwi.org. And there are local chapters. If you, if you can't um, join the national organization, then go to one of the meetings of your local chapter. If you go to that website, you click on, on regions, uh, the different local regions will pop up. And very often, um, 
Very often regions will have get-togethers, they might have an annual conference, they might have critique groups that you can join for free, um, where you get, get to talk to other people who have immersed themselves in writing for children, whether they're already published or not. There's a mix of people from people who have published many, many books to, to writers who are just starting out who belong to this group. And so I started out as a member of SCBWI. I started going to their conferences. I, I looked into um, uh, classes and day-long workshops locally. And uh, at the time I was living in Los Angeles and UCLA Extension has, a, has a, an outstanding uh, writers program. And I went to a one day UCLA extension class on everything you need to know to write and sell your children's book. And I was there to learn to sell. I thought, what do you need to know to, to write? I'll be fine with writing. I need to know how to sell. Well, and uh, I wasn't even interested in listening to most of the speakers. I wanted to hear the editor at the end of the day talk about how the acquisition process at a publisher at a publishing company works. And Right before lunch, I was, um, you know, I was listening to all of the, all of the uh, sessions because I was there. Right before lunch, Myra Cohn Livingston got up to speak, and I had no idea who she was. Myra Cohn Livingston, the name meant nothing to me. She got up. She said she was the author of over 80 books of poetry, poetry for children, and because I didn't like poetry as a kid, I started tuning her out and just doodling and then uh, she started reading poems and reciting poems that caught my attention. And I thought, wow, I can learn something from her. And so after so many, a couple dozen uh, rejection letters, I decided I did need to learn how to write for children. That maybe writing for children was different from writing uh, a legal memo or just uh, a regular letter. And, and so I took Myra Cohn Livingston's beginning class in poetry and it just um, uh, opened my eyes up to, uh, to, to what children's poetry was and I fell in love with it. And now I write mainly poetry. Here you are, yeah. And you know, I'm so glad you mentioned SCBWI. It has, it has helped to change my life because I, I never considered myself to be a writer. I mean, I was an academic writer because I had to keep my job at the university, you know, but to actually plunge in and write a story, uh, you know, for children was way beyond my venue, you know, and I, I thought, oh boy. Um, but I tried, you know, and, and uh, I joined a writer's group sponsored by S my local SCBWI and uh, that changed my life. So I'm so glad you mentioned that because, well, you, you know, and Tony, I used to read Mr. Semolina, Semolinas to uh -huh. my son when he was a kid. Was that your first one? Yeah, that was the first one. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. And yeah. I'm excited to see, to see that you have a new book. Tell us what your new book is. Well, it's um, Lucas and the Game of Chance. And what I did this time, uh, thanks for asking. What I did this time was because I had been working with uh, traditional stories, folk tales and fairy tales, uh, because of my affiliation with Greece, I wanted to go off on my own. I had been working with my Greek colleagues, but I thought, I want to turn this into a full-fledged fantasy. And, and how can I do that? And so I, joined, I, I happened to come into this writing group uh, these, you know, with writers, uh, published writers, and they helped me along a lot. And so there it is, you know, I, I, you, you've seen it. It's um, illustrated with 10, 10 uh, pen and ink illustrations. And it's quite, it's quite dramatic. The story is quite dramatic in terms of uh, loss, separation, and then regaining, you know, regaining yourself after making some mistakes. You know, when I, I, I love talking to kids, when I go into the schools with it, um, I love talking to them about that, that, you know, life can get in the way sometimes. And, we have to learn how to survive and be strong. Well, and that's a message for nowadays, right? Um, um, when I saw uh, when I saw your book cover, my immediate thought was, "This is a book that will appeal so greatly to um, fourth, fifth, sixth grade boys, right? Mm. Because of the snake on the cover, right? Yeah. And um, and and as I read inside, I thought, you know, that really is." a demographic where we tend to lose a lot of readers because 
Younger boys have no problem loving books, and especially when um, they enjoy a read aloud, you know, um, I don't think that there's much difference between boys and girls as, as readers, fourth grade or below. But fifth, sixth, seventh grades, with, in some communities, all of a sudden it's not, um, or in some families, um, it's all of a sudden not so cool anymore to be um, a boy who likes books. And so they need books in particular, like uh, your Lucas book. Oh, well, thank you. I hope so. Uh, it, 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 we'll, we'll see, you know, because it, it just came out in October, so it's still making its way into markets. I read, this, speaking of publishing, <laughs> I read somewhere that when you first started sending your poetry to publishers, you received a lot of rejections. So, A, why did you keep trying? And B, what eventually contribute, contributed to your success? Well, it wasn't the poetry that was getting rejected right, right at the beginning, because right at the beginning, what I really wanted to write was picture books. I wanted to write picture books. And so I was sending out really a picture book a week um, for, for a few months, um, writing a new picture book, um, feeling like, oh, I had to send it out that very same day, but holding off, revising it, revising it, revising it, you know, picking the, the strongest draft, picking a line here, um, a, a chunk of, of that different draft, and knitting them together, and then starting a story on Monday, finishing it by Friday, and sending it out and feeling like I had just sent out my next good night moon. But then, uh, but then the, I, I never got the good night moon letter, right? You know, I was getting these uh, form letter rejections and I, I felt so discouraged, particularly because I grew up in, in um, a working family and money was so important. And um, so just the idea of money as establishing your worth, that is something that I grew up with. And even though I wasn't starving, um, you know, my husband was still um, making his salary. Um, he, he actually was working two jobs and here I was just trying to get published. Um, he, was, he was working his, his regular job and a professor job in the evenings. And I, I was just sitting around daydreaming and writing and getting rejection letters. And so I felt uh, like I really needed to, um, to, to earn my keep or prove my worth or whatever. And we didn't yet have a child. I wasn't planning on, on having a child right then. And we didn't yet have a child. And so I felt like, you know, it, I was in a hurry to establish myself a, as a writer and just and sell a first book. And so uh, the rejection letters were really discouraging, but um, there was no question about giving up. It was just, you know, how many more stories can I write so that I improve my chances of getting published? That was my mindset. Wow. Yeah. That, and I'm so glad you see, you're talking about this because, I mean, uh, you know, we, we all get uh, worried about rejections, you know what I mean? And, and so many, so many uh, writers I've talked to just get so discouraged. Sometimes they give up, you know, and, uh, you, you know, but I think if you, if, if you find your voice, let me put it that way, and you find your, you know, your comfort uh, as a writer, then, um, then you're, you're good for gold, you know? And, and I think you, I think that's what you did. I mean, I, I just think, so what happened? I mean, you started sending out poetry? Well, uh, no. So I was still sending out the picture books, but you remember I said I had, I had heard Myra Cohn Livingston at that one day UCLA extension seminar, right? Yeah, yes. Well, then after all those rejection letters, I said, well, I, I think I do need to learn how to write. So I saw that Myra Cohn Livingston was offering a beginning class in poetry. And I thought, well, I'm not really interested in writing poetry, but I was so impressed with Myra. I knew I could learn something from her. And I thought, maybe if I learn about rhyme and repetition and rhythm, those poetic devices, then maybe I can write a picture book that will sell. And so I signed up for her class and actually had the audacity to say, the first day when we went around the group, everybody introducing themselves, I actually said, I'm not really here to write poetry. I'm here to learn about poetry so that I can sharpen my prose so that I can sell a picture book. And people stared at me like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was oblivious. I didn't realize that so many of them 
were really Myra Cohen Livingston groupies. They had taken this beginning class several times because they, uh, they, they cherished um, what she had to, to teach them. Um, but it was Myra who said to me, you're not ready to be published. And I said, when will I be ready? And she said, I will tell you. Oh. Yeah. And I thought, okay, all right. So, so because of that, when I finally had amassed a fair number of poems, not necessarily because I wanted to write poems for publication, but because I was writing poems for the, the weekly homework. When I had amassed, amassed a fair number of poems, I, uh, I gave them to Myra and I said, well, can you tell me if I'm ready? And she said, okay, I'll, I'll let you know. And then the next thing I knew, she called me up and said, guess what I did? I just sold your first book. Oh, Right. And so that, that was the, um, the pile of poems that became Good Luck Gold. Her editor, her longtime editor, Margaret McElderry, who had been uh, an editor at Harcourt and Athenaeum, and then um, launched her own imprint, uh, Margaret K. McElderry Books, which exists to this day as part of Simon & Schuster, even though Margaret um, herself passed away about, oh, I want to say um, about 15 years ago. Mm. Um, uh, Margaret was staying at Myra Cohn Livingston's house. Um, she was there to give the uh, Arbuthnot Lecture for uh, the American Library Association. And while she was staying at Myra's house, Myra said, let me show you some poems by one of my students. And that's how my first book got sold. That's so that's uh, that's so encouraging. <laughs> and no, seriously, I mean, because you know, you hear so often that well, they're just not interested, you know. But uh, but people, there is a chain uh, uh, there, you know. And I think that that is good to hear. That sometimes you know, putting yourself out a little bit, and you know, putting your work out a little bit, and being courageous about it, because it's a vulnerable thing, you know, when. Um, you know, I, I find the same thing in a writing among the writers in my writing group that it's a kind of vulnerability that I allow myself to uh, uh, experience so that I can grow as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I think I think as published writers, we need to um, to it's sort of incumbent upon us to encourage new writers and say, don't give up and to remind them of things like, you know, Dr. Seuss had over 40 rejection letters. Even JK Rowling had rejection letters for Harry Potter, believe it or not. Right. So uh, you never, you never know uh, why somebody is turning down your book. Maybe um, it's not a question of your writing being good enough. Maybe um, instead they have, just bought another story about dragons. And so they couldn't possibly have yours. Or um, maybe, um, you know, they, they just bought five picture books and what they need is a young adult novel this next month. And so it's not that your picture book isn't good. They just don't have room to publish another one. Yeah. So I think that we need to, to um, as published writers, uh, it's our particular duty to, to lift other people up when they're still getting started. Wonderful to hear. And uh, I, I, that's a good message for all of us. Let, let's turn to the popular Friday Poetry Anthology series and the interactive Poetry Friday Power Book series. Uh, it has to be one of the most inspiring programs we have for getting kids and teens to love poetry. When you and Sylvia Vardell, your co-author, set out to develop these, seri this, these series or this series, what, what did the two of you hope to achieve? Well, I had already had 21 books published by the time uh, that Sylvia eight years ago said to me, why don't we start our own company and start publishing books that make it easy for teachers to teach poetry? And um, I, my, my first 21 books were with big companies, uh, Simon & Schuster, Harcourt, and and when Sylvia suggested this, I thought, wow, you know, it would be really, um, it could be really neat to do something independent and quick, 
where we are in control. My last book that was published by Simon & Schuster was Homegrown House. Homegrown House is a picture book that was illustrated by E.B. Lewis. And that book took nine years to come out. Nine years from the day that I sold it until the day that it came out. Um, On the other hand, when Sylvia and I are working on something, it might just take um, nine weeks um, until the time we finish doing it until the time it comes out. So um, having creative control is really exciting. And we wanted to do something that, that, um, that, that made poetry more popular, that made poetry easy for, for teachers, that made poetry more fun for kids. Um, so um, our first book, our first several books have take five mini lessons for each poem. Each poem in the book has number one, some tips on how to share it with kids. Number two, tips on how to bring kids in for a second reading where they're doing an echo read or chiming in on a word. Number three, a a super short discussion question. Number four, finally, the skill. Uh, Alliteration, onomatopoeia, rhyme, whatever it is, personification, just a line about what the skill is and and pointing it out. And then number five, a text-to-text connection with another poem in the book or another book. And so um, we we have uh, our first two books were were general, the Poetry Friday Anthology, where there are poems uh, about all different kinds of topics. Then the third one was devoted to science, um, science, technology, engineering, math, STEM topics. And it's called the Poetry Friday Anthology for Science, um, or for the student edition, it's just called The Poetry of Science, um, which has been endorsed by um, uh, Teachers Co- College, uh, embraced by Teachers College, and and put uh, in the Heinemann uh, kits that are very popular, um, that, that teachers who, who like the Teachers College selections will buy. And then we did one that is focused on social studies called the Poetry Friday Anthology for celebrations. All different kinds of celebrations from traditional days like President's Day to su- super silly fun celebrations like Crazy Hat, Crazy Hat Day, right? And um, that book is bilingual, Spanish. 156 poems in English and the same poems translated into Spanish by a professional translator and vetted by a team of um, people from all over the Spanish speaking world. And then after we finished the Poetry Friday Anthology series, we actually did launch the second series, the Poetry Friday Power Book series, where we really uh, emphasize writing. So we make the reading and writing connection. Uh, Those are interactive writing journals uh, that also are stories and poems. Yeah. And it, they, it, I use them all the time and it's good for me because if I'm with a group of kids, I'll act out one of the poems and then they feel free to do that with me. You know what I mean? Oh, because, yeah. Because the, 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 the strategies, the, the methods, whatever you want to call those that, you know, you, you, you bring into the poem or let help the poem come alive. It just is, it's just glorious. And it's, well, thank you. Yeah, thank and you. So, but every everything in those books, they're they're all so tight. Everything is connected. You know what I right. mean? Right. And I, I love that, and teachers adore it. I mean, every time I mention it, I will hear someone say to me, "Oh, I use those all the time. They they just really work beautifully." You know, so that's what a gift that has been for all of us who go out there. And uh, well, thank you. And well, right now with with a lot of students looking for something supplemental to do at home. Pet Crazy is great for K through maybe fourth grade, third or fourth grade for kids who, who love pets and they can write in the books and draw in the books and, and do all kinds of activities. Then for older kids, like third, fourth grade and up, uh, really all the way up, um, Here We Go, which is about uh, kids who want to change the world, starting with a food drive and a walkathon and a school garden. Here We Go encourages social activism and just getting interested in the world and what you can do to be part of it. And then um, for tweens and teens who are all into identity and sports and food and movies, uh, those are the topics that are covered in uh, 
you just wait a Poetry Friday Power Book. And so we're really hoping that kids who have time on their hands at home um, will get those books and connect with them and write and draw like crazy in them and own those books, own those stories and write their own poems. This is great. I'm, I'm going to feature though, you know, I, I haven't looked as, at those as much as I've looked at the other ones. And now that you're pointing out to me how important they are, I mean, I, I, I like the topic so much. I'll, I'll be featuring those on my website, you know, in a kind of, because um, uh, I do have a blog on the website that uh, I did some, I did some work with poetry for teens, um, you know, so I can now, I can add some, some of these, these great books that, that look at contents. Let me put it that way. You know, and I think that it, it's very inviting. One feature of your life as a poet that emerges from a visit to your website are the diverse presentations and workshops you offer in both national and international schools. What do you consider to be your most consistent theme about writing and reading when you work with students? The one thing that I repeat over and over and over is five minutes a day, just five minutes a day, Put your own time into building your skills. If you wanted to be a star basketball player in high school, you would not just uh, limit yourself to school games. You would be dribbling the ball after school like crazy. You'd be shooting hoops at every opportunity. You would put in your own time to build your skills. And what I want kids to do is five minutes a day, write just for fun write just for fun. They don't even have to show it to anyone. It doesn't even have to be complete sentences, right? I, I tell kids five minutes before dinner, if you are starving, <laughs> take out a piece of paper and write a list poem of everything you wish you could eat at this <laughs> very moment. And the next thing you know, you're going to have a three page poem and you'll look up and dinner will be on the table. <laughs> next time you're, you're so eager to watch your favorite TV show. Sit down five minutes before it starts and right in front of the TV and write about what you think you're going to see. Write about what you think will happen. And then you can watch the show, right? Five minutes a day. We need to build our skills, put in our own time, write about whatever it is that, that's on our minds, right? And yep. then um, um, that's, that's how we get to be better writers. That's how we're going to reach breakthrough writing. And also that's how we'll feel better about ourselves because when you can express yourselves, when you have that outlet, when you're comfortable expressing yourselves on paper, you become a more relaxed person and a better person. Oh, that's so nice to put, that, put it that way. There's, there's a psychology there that I hadn't really ever heard it articulated that way, but it makes so much sense to me. You also offer workshops and conferences uh, and conference presentations to a lot of teachers. For example, one that caught my eye, you call um, making connections through poetry, writers, readers, teachers. Tell us about the teaching tips and inspiration you hope teachers will gain from your work with them. Well, that was a topic actually that we addressed as a group, Sylvia Vardell, myself, Selena Gonzalez, uh, Susan Blackaby, and Joan McCullough. We were at AWP, the Writers' Conference in Texas, just, um, I think, uh, last week it was. Maybe it was 10 days ago, but I think it might have just been last week, and addressed an audience on that topic where we shared ways that you can bring poetry into the curriculum. You know, a lot of people might say, I don't have time for poetry, but there is a poem about any topic that you want to, to address. Any topic in the curriculum, you can find a poem to teach it. Anything that's on your mind that you're worried about, you can find a poem, or in five minutes or less, you can write your own poem about it, at least a first draft of that poem. So um, that's one of the things that we want pe te teachers really to, to think um, about is how useful and easy it is to share poetry and to integrate it into the day in all different ways, reading, writing, and teaching. Yeah, there we go. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, there are so many poems out there that you can choose from, and I think you make that very obvious. What advice do you give for anyone who wants to aspire to a career as a poet? Again, it's five minutes at a time. 
five minutes at a time. So many people, I meet so many people who say, it's my dream to write a novel, but I can't do it now. I'll do it when I have time. And I say to them, you know what? You can make time, maybe only five minutes today, but honor yourself, honor your, your dream, honor your story, and just for five minutes, write. And maybe your ideas still are too disjointed that you can't write them into paragraphs. Well, then write a few lines on post-its or index cards and shuffle them around later on when you have enough of them. But if you want, if you want to do it, now is the time. Just sit down, five minutes, get some ideas down, and then you can improve them later. And one of the neat things about, about poetry is it teaches us, really, uh, the power of revision. You can take a first draft of a poem and very easily. So what I'll tell kids is if your first draft rhymed, do a second draft that uses zero rhyme. If your first draft didn't rhyme, put at least one rhyme pair into it for a second draft. Don't try to make it better. Just try to make it different, right? Try to make it different. And that's how we can inch our way to writing whatever books are inside of us. Five minutes at a time, one draft at a time. That's great. Yeah. And you're, you know, you're inspiring me. I'm working on a story right now where I've got to get this ship from a storm into a cove and I'm just going to go ahead and do it because I'm so afraid of it because I'm thinking, wait a minute, I don't know anything about nautical stuff. Why am I doing this? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, and you know, you could do, you could do a poem um, for fun. Start out with a found poem. You could go to some page on the web that has a bunch of nautical information, right? Yeah. And do a found poem where you just uh, print out the page and just circle like 20 words and somehow string them together into a poem that uses a lot of those nautical words and, and just have a first draft that way. Great. I'm going to do that. I, I mean it. I'm, I, I just, I'm ready for it. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Would, yeah, would, would you like to tell, we're, we're coming to the end. I mean, I've, I've taken so much of your time. Would you, would you like to tell us about projects you're currently working on? Well, Sylvia Vardell and I are working on a brand new book that's called Hop to It. Hop to It, uh, Poems to Get You Moving. All right. And we think that kids need to, um, to, to move more, to be more active. And we're putting together this anthology of poems that will uh, help teachers, librarians, parents, grandparents, camp counselors, after school activities, people help them um, uh, uh, get kids moving, uh, get the wiggles out so that kids are ready to learn. And that's one book that we're uh, putting some finishing touches on very soon. It's coming out in the fall. But right now, I don't know when this is going to air, but I have a feeling that whenever it airs, we might still be in the midst of the coronavirus problem, I have, for lack of a better word. Right. And so one thing that I'm trying to do is uh, on a daily basis to write some new poem that gives hope to kids or has something to do with the topic, but in a fun way. So uh, one of the poems that I wrote um, recently was called Don't Touch Your Face, right? Because yeah. we're hearing that now, Don't Touch yeah. Your Face. And it's kind of a fun, funny poem about how we, we shouldn't touch our face. And then on the other hand, I've also written some serious poems. Like this one I wrote, um, I wrote, last month called Look for Birds. And maybe we can finish with me reading this one. Look for Please. Birds. It could be worse. It is worse somewhere for someone. Today will blend into tomorrow. Tomorrow will become next week. Everything happening now will become just one page in a history book in a hundred years. Let's look out the window. Come. Let's look for birds. Wow. Please, please. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Janet, thank you so much. I, I'm just, I have enjoyed this so much. And uh, you're, you know, you, you're so inspiring. 
And uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you for hosting, for having me um, here to, to talk to, to, to teachers, librarians, parents, kids, writers, uh, book lovers. You, you do so much with uh, your outreach work. It's just been an honor to be able to talk well, to you. I'm so glad of it. And I want to tell people that if uh, you, you want to find out more about Janet Wong, her website is JanetWong.com. That's W O N G. Janet, thank you so much. It's been such a joy. Bye, Tony. 